Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Equitable Measures, the Role of Assessments in Education. We're thrilled to have you with us as we begin an exploration aimed at positioning practitioners to understand and reform educational assessments to ensure fair access to opportunities for all students, particularly those from underrepresented and underserved communities. Today, our goal is to unpack the complex dynamics of educational assessments and their profound impact on equity within our education systems. We'll delve into how current assessment practices can inadvertently perpetuate disparities and explore actionable strategies for fostering a more inclusive and just approach to measuring educational success. My name is Bruce Johnson, your host for today's discussion. I serve as a senior associate at Community Science, where my focus lies in fostering educational equity and advancing policy change through strategic evaluation and research. I have a robust background in higher education administration, particularly within community colleges. I've dedicated my career to enhancing educational pathways and workforce development opportunities for underrepresented groups. Together today, we'll hear from distinguished experts who will share their uh, perspectives and experiences offering both a deep dive into the challenges and a look at innovative solutions that are making a difference. Please allow me to introduce you to Dr. Erica Williams, the Vice President of Education at Dogwood Health Trust. Dr. Williams brings over two decades of experience in education from teaching and scholarship to leadership. Her work is dedicated to leveraging uh, philanthropy to tackle systemic educational challenges, especially those for traditionally those who are traditionally marginalized in our society. She has a rich history of building partnerships and initiating programs that enhance educational opportunities and equity, particularly in Western North Carolina. Joining her is Dr. Carlos Angiano, Managing Associate at Community Science. Carlos has a profound background in educational psychology and is passionate about ensuring that all learners have equitable access to high quality education. He specializes in evaluating educational programs, designing inclusive data collection methods, and enhancing family, school, and community partnerships. Carlos is particularly focused on using his expertise to support parent leadership and advocating for systemic changes. Together, their combined insights will help us to explore the critical role assessments play in shaping educational opportunities and outcomes. We hope that you leave today's session equipped with valuable insights and aspire to advocate for change within your own spheres of influence. Let's embark on this crucial conversation with open minds and a shared commitment to transforming educational outcomes for every student. Thank you for being a part of uh, today's important discussion. Just a little background on Community Science, uh, the organization that is hosting today's discussion. <clears throat> At Community Science, our mission is to help community and government organizations, foundations, and nonprofits tackle complex social problems by providing expert research and development services. Our goal is to strengthen the science and practice of community change in order to improve the well being of people and the organizations that serve them. Community Science is a wholly owned subsidiary of BCT Partners. Through our work, we aim to amplify voices from underserved communities, foster collaborative change, and support sustainable impact. Today's webinar will guide you through a series of lessons learned and actionable strategies aimed at transforming educational assessments for equity. We'll start by examining the inherent limit limitations of traditional assessments, We'll then delve into the systemic barriers that perpetuate disparities in educational assessments. Our conversation will also highlight the critical role of philanthropy in supporting educational equity. And finally, we'll explore the power of parental engagement in education. So for today's agenda, we've actually already covered uh, a decent portion of it. Uh, we started off with introductions and uh, provided you some insight into community science and shared key takeaways. Um, the next portion of our uh, discussion today will provide just a little bit of background and context as we then transition into our panel discussion. And then uh, we ask that you go ahead and drop any questions that you may have of the panelists, if, whether you have them now or if they emerge throughout the conversation into the Q&A portion, and we'll make sure that we lend attention to addressing those as time permits at the end. 
Assessments serve a, a critical gatekeeping function, and they often determine the trajectory of a student's academic and professional future. Um, placement tests and standardized tests, well, they're central to this process uh, and are employed broadly across institutions to evaluate students' readiness for college level work. Now, the intent behind those tests is to ensure students are adequately prepared to tackle the curriculum that they'll encounter in their courses. This process, um, theoretically, aids educational institutions in aligning instructional resources with student needs. However, the impact of these assessments, assessments extends far beyond the initial sorting of students into various levels of introductory coursework. The results of placement tests, for instance, directly influence a student's starting point in college, often placing them in developmental prerequisite classes that do not count towards a degree. This can extend their time in college, increase their educational costs, and affect their motivation and likelihood of completion. Other standardized tests such as SATs or ACTs play a significant role in the admission decisions and also influence uh, which students gain entry into higher education institutions and subsequently which doors are open or closed to them in the professional world. I reference these assessment tools uh, because while they're designed to measure academic preparedness, they also inadvertently set many students, particularly those from underserved communities, on a path with limited opportunities. The early academic pathways determined by these tests can also predict the level of academic achievement these students will reach and the career options that are available to them after graduation. Understanding the profound effects that these assessments have on students' academic and career futures is crucial. It compels us to critically analyze the fairness and effectiveness of these measures and to advocate for systems that genuinely uplift all students towards their highest potential. As we delve deeper into our discussion, it's also crucial to acknowledge the pervasive and disproportionate impacts that these assessment methodologies exert on marginalized student groups. For students from historically underserved communities, standardized tests and placement exams can often misrepresent their potential and readiness. This misalignment disproportionately affects their ability to access educational opportunities and sets a precedent that follows them from K-12 into higher education. This has a ripple effect on graduation of rates, uh, both high school graduation as well as college graduation. Research consistently shows that marginalized students, particularly those from low-income backgrounds, graduate at lower rates than their peers. This disparity is not just about academic preparation, but it's also about how these students are assessed and subsequently supported through their educational journey. As we continue to take today's discussion, let's keep these long-term impacts in mind, understanding that these challenges, understanding these challenges, I should say, is the, is the first step towards developing more equitable assessment practices that truly reflect the diverse strengths and potentials of all students, paving the way for more inclusive educational and career opportunities. As we transition into our panel discussion today, let's let's focus on the critical critical role that community plays in promoting meaningful changes in assessment practices. Parents are instrumental in this process because they provide unique insights into how assessment practices affect their children, both inside and outside the classroom. Their advocacy and feedback are vital in pushing for assessments that truly measure and support their children's learning and development. But then students, they too are, are central in this conversation because they're the ones that are directly impacted by these assessments and they must have a voice in how they're designed and implemented. Educators from teachers to high school administrators play a dual role. They're both implementers and evaluators of assessment practices and their professional expertise and daily interaction with diverse student, student, student populations equip them with the necessary knowledge to identify shortcomings in the current methods equity focused organizations. They provide the research, resources, and advocacy needed to drive systemic change. And lastly, school administration and leadership, they're pivotal in operationalizing changes. Their commitment to reform can lead to the adoption of policies that prioritize equity and support all students' educational journeys. So as we get ready to engage uh, today's panel discussion, I wanna start off by uh, directly engaging both of our panelists uh, with a question and asking them uh, to elaborate on their working definition of assessments. So panelists, how do these tools 
vary across educational settings? And what should our audience keep in mind about the role of assessments in both reflecting and shaping student outcomes in education? And I'll ask maybe, how about Erica? Would you mind kicking us off with that response? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, you know, first, let me just go back to the what is the base word um, there. Assessment is from the Latin word acidere. And excuse me to people that were formerly taught Latin. I had to stumble into it. Um, but acidere means to sit beside or sit with. Um, and so when I think about the most basic level of um, or primary, maybe micro level of assessment, I think about the classroom. Um, and I think about the teacher that understands, or the instructor, the professor, if we're talking a higher ed situation, that understands that assessment really is an opportunity to learn and unpack what your learners bring to the table, who they are, what they know around a subject or a content level or area, um, and also an opportunity to unpack what's next. Um, you know, so there is assessment of learning, assessment for learning, and then assessment as learning, with the last one being the place where the student is an active part in the assessor role. Um, and it functions as a way for them to engage and really own that learning and growth process for themselves. Um, so I think at its best, particularly when it's filtered through a prism of equity, assessment gives us such a wonderful opportunity to unpack who our students are, what they bring to topics, what's left for them to explore, and then how they're interrogating or working through that concept, content, et cetera, on their own in meaningful ways, in meaningful ways. Um, and I, I hope, what, what was the other part of that question? Did I miss a part of that or is it time to ping it over to you, Carlos? <laughs> No, you captured well, it well, especially about, especially in relation to uh, how they vary across educational settings. Yes, thank, thank you. you. And so, with that, I agree with everything Dr. Erica said and Dr. Williams said. I go, but I want to take a different approach on this and go from a higher level. And if you do a Google search and you look up education assessment in the U.S., you're going to be bombarded with pages on the National National Center for Education Standard Assessments. You'll get Nation's report card. You'll get information on standardized assessments, really talking about the flaws of the education system and how assessments aren't benefiting them in the way that they should. With that being said, I do want to note that there's more than just one type of assessment. Large-scale assessments is one form, but taken from the American Psychological Association definition, assessment at its simplest form is really just an assessment process that allows you to obtain information from participants and use that to make references or judgments based on that information. So when you take that definition in general and think about that, how it applies to everything that we do, we're constantly making assessments in what we do. We're constantly making assessments in how we do it. The real, it, the real, be, the real, the real question and def, defining definition point of assessment to me is more that it has to be valid and reliable. And to me, what that means is it has to be accurate in what it's saying that it's measures. And it has to consistently measure the, that trait over a consistent number of times. So although I do value psychometric properties and I do know, understand the importance of them to large scale assessments, that is a small proportion of the assessments that are in this world that we utilize. And a lot of the times we utilize assessments in program evaluations and also education research to get that information. But a lot of the times we're adapting assessments that have already been validated as being valid and reliable, but the minute we change any type of that information, the DAO purpose and the intent of the assessment now changes. So one thing I do wanna emphasize as being the most important thing that I focus on is the purpose and intent. So in order for an assessment to be valid and reliable, it has to be doing what it's saying it's gonna do and consistently doing that as well. So all those psychometric properties are there at the heart of it, it's really just making sure it's assessing what we're trying to assess. And so, I say that in general because I know a lot of the times this anxiety, I, I know a lot of the times just the word assessment causes anxiety in a lot of people. Me specifically, I hate assessments and I'll say that openly. I am at best a C student according to any test that I've ever taken across my education. However, I've demonstrated higher aptitude and cognition based on the conversations that I'm able to hold. And I've been fortunate that I've had professors and educators that have been able to see that there's different forms of assessments and utilize it to make a, an actual decision about my best interest and how to improve me. 
So taking at best, an assessment is something that we use to make decisions based on the information we gather. Excellent. Thank you very much, Carlos. And if, from your perspective, Carlos, how, how would you describe the current state of assessments uh, in education research and evaluation? That's a loaded question, Bruce, but I'll do my best. I will do my best to answer that. Right now, I'm optimistic, and I'll tell you why I'm optimistic. Because I think there's change coming. I think anytime you get people questioning what is the purpose of this and how are we use it, utilizing these decisions is an opportunity for people to engage conversations about differences and expectations. So I think we're in a good place right now in regards to people being aware that assessments exist. From my understanding, assess large-scale assessments have really been the dominant culture within academics over the last decade. And that has really dominated the conversation and led to some belief that assessments align with teacher quality and overall instruction practices. I do wanna note that that was never the intention of a large-scale assessment. A large-scale assessment, the purpose was it to really gauge how the student is doing compared to the national, the national average. And so it was really designed to, define, to decide what's being done and how to divide strategies to improve that. Yet we come to a place where we think of everyone just taking tests. And so it comes to the point now where teachers are saying, we're teaching to the tests and our students are learning different, different stuff. It's parents saying, why are you utilizing different assessments? Well, the national standard is the standardized assessment. So when you shift from that standard, you cause controversy in every way. I think one of the, one of the impacts, and I think it's an important impact of the COVID-19 was it highlighted those assumptions we have within assessment. I will provide you a concrete example of that. Uh, at the COVID-19, people of color, the resources they need so they can do well in the education that they're doing, because we know that's a concern. How that manifested, how that manifested came out in very different ways. Utah, this, uh, Utah had the intent and had the purpose and was really, really, really intentional about the way they did things. So they wanted to get perception of how other people did. So they asked teachers, hey, you guys are familiar with the students. What services do they need? And out of that conversation, the conversation was that they need internet and they need electronic devices. So Utah decided to do a grant and provide those resources to all schools within the, U within the Utah school district. And that was great. Found out everything was great. We now did an evaluation of it. One of the questions came out and it was huge that most of the partners who received funding, they didn't utilize all their resources to get the stuff that they needed. And so that caused a huge question within the organization and the board members asked, why didn't they use that information? And so we developed questions to get that information. And what we found out was that it wasn't necessarily that they needed internet. They needed support on how to use the internet, how to troubleshoot, how to, how to activate it within their schools and how to provide support for their children. So because of that, parents were able to support their children in that area. Utah had good intentions of what they wanted to do. They wanted, saw a need and they wanted to fill it, but because they didn't include the parents in the decision-making process about what's there and didn't get their perception, they used an assessment that didn't really identify the problem and they made decisions based on that that was inaccurate. So I think we're in a good place in regard to education assessment because I believe we're focusing on culturally responsive practices. We're talking more about equity informed assessment practices. The National Center for Education Assessment has also developed a handbook on equity within assessment. But what that fails to address are everyday assessments that we utilize within programs. How do we take practical assessments and use them in a classroom to make informed decisions also in programs? Large scale assessments are great for one purpose, but we need to start diversifying our use of assessments and also including multiple perspectives in it so we can really get a holistic culturally responsive assessment that's really going to tell us whether or not the program is working and how we can improve it. Thank you, Carlos. And I appreciate that latter portion because you actually started touching on a follow-up question that I had for you, which was uh, what type of changes would you like to see in how assessments are designed and utilized? And I think that you've touched on that in a, in a big way, but are, are there any other things that you might like to add to that regarding what type of transformative changes you might like to see? Yeah, that's that's good because I think we need to start we need to start taking a step back on assessment and really talk about it holistically as individuals and how it benefits us because I think there's a misunderstanding on the use of assessment and how it's being utilized. I think one thing we can do is educate 
multiple stakeholders about the purpose of them. We can also add, add include, invite them to, include, to provide insight into that. Also, multiple stakeholders can also provide information on content expertise, which is content validity. And they can talk about the construct, how is a term being defined? So if we're talking about parent involvement, what does that look like to multiple parents? I assume, and based on the research, that everyone views parental involvement in a different state in a different way. From my perspective, my culture viewed, viewed assessments as an opportunity for me to pass or fail, and it was never geared towards improving. So a lot of the times the assessments were viewed as a punitary, punitary issue as opposed to being beneficial. And I think a lot of that stuff's got lost in what's being done. So I think in order for us to transform this, we really have to make more people involved. I think we also need to have more conversations like this, where we talk about assessments in a practical way. Not many people can understand the psychometric properties of assessments, and I will be fully transparent. I, that was what my PhD was in. I understand and I can translate it to what other people mean, but to get that deeper understanding, it's really lost in me because I don't understand the practical application of it. So I really want us to really take assessments now as really being the, the main goal of trying to assess a program is because if our measurements are not aligned with our program goals, we're measuring inaccurate information. So the decisions we're making are now based on information that's not relevant. I've seen programs close based on decisions. I've seen funders come with a different perception on where they wanted to take their next, next strategy based on inaccurate information. So I think in order for us to transform that, we really need to start having these discussions and including multiple perspectives as we discuss it. Excellent, thank you. Dr. Williams, in Carlos's response, he, he shared, um, even some personal, uh, some ways that, uh, you know, assessments have impacted him personally and how he's even navigated uh, those assessments and uh, their intended usage. So I want to center a little bit on utilization. H how do you see the role of assessments as gatekeepers in education? And what changes would you advocate for to ensure that they serve as gateways instead of barriers for marginalized students? Yeah, thank you for that. And Carlos's examples hit home in so many ways. Um, you know, first and foremost, as a classroom teacher who watched um, assessments be used in a gatekeeping, almost weaponized kind of way, um, particularly for students that were um, culturally and linguistically diverse. Uh, when I taught in rural settings and public K-12 schools, I saw a lot of assessments being used to keep kids out of academically gifted programs and then to disproportionately on the other side of that coin, put them in um, classifications for emotionally disturbed, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we've got decades of literature and research out there on what happens um, when we use assessments in that way. And um, to the point of what he mentioned too, that hit home as well, Carlos, around um, test defining who you are, that at best you're an average student. You're a PhD in psychometrics. Mm -hmm. Just let that sit for a second. <laughs> you know, think about it. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I go back, Bruce, to your question, to the first part of that. And I look at kind of the, the, the history behind some of these key pieces with what Carlos unpacked there. Um, intent versus use. Right, because now we're getting into valid and validity and reliability. I used to teach um, for years. I taught a course on human growth and development and educational psychology, and I would bring in different theorists and and um, people that were critical to this notion of achievement, success, learning, cognitive development. Um, and this was in the early two thousands. But um, Howard Gardner at the time was getting a lot of attention and multiple intelligences, and for good reason. Although he would have been the first to say that a lot of his own theories were were misused and misinterpreted and used against um, in the very way that he didn't intend. But one of the things I used to show with students was some of his lectures where he talked about what happened when Alfred Binet's exam crossed over to America and became standardized by um, the, uh, by Stanford University. Um, you know, we know it as the Stanford Binet. It's, it's kind of been used now for decades as kind of gold standard for um, IQ assessments. But what's really interesting is that was never Binet's original intent. Um, he was asked by the French government to design that test to kind of help them decide who needed academic assistance, 
right? It was later used to determine who was feeble-minded. Um, and from there, um, you know, it became really notable that he originally had concerns about limitations of his own assessment. And he had concerns about ways that it could grow and improve. And he did not believe that there should be a single quantitative measure to define intelligence. He did not believe intelligence was fixed. And one of the things that Gardner used to talk about was that somehow we've transposed that here uh, on our shores into this dipstick theory of intelligence, kind of of the old days. I don't know what's under car hoods anymore because I don't even open mine up. But we used to check the oil under the engine and you would, you know, you, you clean the stick, you dip it back in, cold oil, you pull it out, you can know exactly how much oil is in there. And, and Gardner used to reference these kinds of assessments used in these ways as this dipstick theory of intelligence that we then transformed into saying that this kid, because of this measure on this day at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday, this is where they are, this is their capacity, this is where they need to be tracked, sorted, taught, et cetera. And it became this fixed notion. You know, um, I also used to share a lot about Dr. Asa Hilliard, um, uh, passed away in 2007, kind of, um, um, he was leading students as always on an excursion in Africa and contracted malaria. Um, but Dr. Hilliard spent his life's research um, unpacking. He was a, like you, Carlos, he was a psychometrician. He was a psychologist. He was a uh, past founding member of the National Black Child Development Institute. He was on the board for the American College of Teacher Education, and he was a vehement opponent of how IQ testing was being used and codified um, in exactly the same way um, that I mentioned earlier to determine that primarily African-American learners um, were not qualified to be able to be ready to be taught. Um, and disproportionately placed in special education classes for the behaviorally, emotionally disabled. Um, he wrote powerful papers. He had one paper that was presented, I think, in 1979 to the American Psychological Association, where he essentially talked about the ideology of intelligence and how it had been used, that, that instrument had been used um, wrongfully in schools, and that he called for the absolute um, cancellation of that tool and its use, and in, instead asked that teachers do formative diagnostic work with learners and build on that assessment of learning, assessment for learning piece that I talked about earlier. Dr. Hilliard's words would be um, carried on in quite a few ways, but you also saw court cases that used a lot of his the basis of his thought, his challenges to how these tests were being used from a psycho psychometric standpoint. I just think that we have a long history of understanding and unpacking how we've misinterpreted, misused assessments, and as such, turned them into gatekeeping practices, which was not the intent um, from the beginning. Excellent. Thank you. And, you know, based on uh, some of our previous conversations, I already knew that you had a, a deep understanding of some of the root causes behind disparities in educational assessments. So I really appreciate you uh, sharing uh, what you have. And um, you really hit on some of the key systemic barriers that perpetuate these disparities. So um, let, let me ask you, though, in response to that, might you have any uh, suggestions on how we might be able to uh, further dismantle some of those challenges that you spoke to? Yeah, you know, I would go back. Um, the National Institute for Learning Outcomes and Assessment, I, I worked with them for quite a few years. Um, we were brought in um, and invited in, we meaning scholars, individuals that were dedicated to um, education and assessment and accreditation to help with um quite a few pieces with higher ed access, post-secondary access. And it was there that I met Natasha Jankowski and George Koo and other heavyweights in the assessment world for post-secondary ed. Natasha and Eric Montenegro published a piece called um, Equity and Assessment, Culturally Responsive Assessment. And there were so many nuggets in what they wrote that really built off of this culturally responsive teaching framework that some of the, I would say, heavyweights like Dr. Geneva Gay and 
Gloria Latz and Billings, people that have spent their whole life's work dedicated to what does it mean to have a culturally responsive classroom? What does it mean to have a culturally responsive institution? What does it mean to flip your instruction on its head and to make sure that you are understanding that culture and language and cognition work in tandem? And so Eric and Natasha um, published a very seminal piece around that the responsibility that assessors have in making sure that their practices are culturally responsive and embedded. You know, we understand that students have multiple ways of learning, but then we say they all must show up and have it assessed in one singular way. Um, we understand that we have there are multiple intelligences and multiple ways that people retrieve and export information, but we tell them they have to show up at this day at this time, and it has to be a multiple choice test. You know, so a lot of the things that we know to do, we know to do them if we're doing them through equity, because we've we've already unpacked it on the culturally responsive teaching side. Invite the student into the conversation. Have the student have a menu of choices. Let the student identify the ways they want to demonstrate their learning to you. Have a portfolio of things that they can show over time. And then really critically, you know, and I'll say this as a former department chair, really unpack why you're doing the thing that you're doing to assess learning in the first place. I, I wish I could, I, you know, for privacy reasons, I can't go into this, but the numbers of syllabi that I would have to go through and sit with faculty and ask, why this assessment? Why in this place? And what does it yield? What does it show us about our program outcomes? Yes, now I am an accreditation person. So yes, we have programmatic outcomes. We have degree expectations. There are things that we have to confer with the UNC system. And when a person walks across the stage, that degree should stand for a couple of certain um, dispositions and skills. But explain to me on the most micro level on your syllabus on this assignment, how does this assignment, which is an assessment, how does this midterm, how does this final unpack what our candidates, because I was always in education primarily, what our candidates know and can do? Because if you can't attach it, if you can't explicitly explain why it's there and it means something, it doesn't need to be there. And unfortunately, in our field of assessment, um, Sometimes we do a lot of things out of nostalgia and because it's the way it's always been done. And we really haven't qualified its meaning and purpose and its utility for right now, for learners, for employers, and for where they're going off to beyond us. I think we have a lot of ways that we can diversify and unpack what we've done historically for better outcomes. Excellent. Thank you. You know, uh, uh, one takeaway that uh, I, I gather from this, I, I really appreciate how you kind of weave this tapestry together where you talk about uh, uh, information gained from research, uh, student perspectives, and even uh, faculty input on this process. So that prompts me to kind of begin thinking again about community. Uh, in one of the earlier slides, we talked about this uh, a community of assessment. Uh, so I'm going to pivot in that direction just a little bit. And Carlos, I'm going to ask you um, in the in that thinking in that realm about community anyway, could you share your approach to conducting and evaluating projects uh, that aim to be participatory? Definitely. And, and thank you so much, Erica, for sharing that. I, I do want to add before I go on to that, I do want to add that she talked about the history of it, and that's important. But the reality of it is still going on today. Uh, one perfect example of it is I have three kids. I went, I was obtaining my PhD as my kids are going through school. By, by federal definition, that means they're technically still first year generation because they didn't benefit from that. They didn't benefit from that support before. So my son came home and he was talking about how he was called into the office with 14 other Hispanic and black kids and put in there and what the school what the class was was designed to get them into a trade school and one of these conversations was that came out was they asked them did your parents graduate from college his response was yes right off the bat they told him okay you don't belong here because you have parents that support that so we no longer need to provide support for that my son doesn't want to go to college i would love to learn about what opportunities there are to help him support him in trade school, because I know that I went to a trade school when I did that. I went, I'm a construction laborer. That's my trade. And that's what I've done all my life because that's what my family did. How do I support him in that? I can only right now support him in construction because that's the connection and familiarity that I have. I'd love to learn what other opportunities they are. 
But my kid didn't have those opportunities because he was escorted out because he hit one check mark on there that didn't even align with the overall purpose of the class was. So as a parent, I am a parent first before anything. And so I reached out to the school. I'm like, my son wants to take this class because it's interesting to him. He actually is curious about what opportunities he has. And they're like, well, funding wise, it's based on this requirement. And I'm like, well, that's wrong. You're assessing them inaccurately. What you should be assessing them as, do you want to do this type of work? And if so, here I can get you to do that. And that's not what's being done. This has been now a two year battle with me in the school, really to try to get them to change their assessment practices and really making more opportunities for that because college isn't for everyone. I've learned that. And I know that is people struggle and some for it, it makes sense. And some it doesn't. And I respect everyone's choices, but they should have the opportunity to make those choices based on sound assessment practices that really support them and help improve them overall. So I just wanted to add that. And, and so to, to tie on to the, the next question. So the first thing I do as I approach any evaluation, specifically participatory, is what does that mean? Everybody has an understanding of what participatory means. To some founders, that's them just really being at the table listening to the conversations. Others, they're driving the assessment practices. Other times, they're just participating in regards to providing content knowledge and providing validity on that aspect of it. So everybody had a different role. But we had to come to a common shared understanding of what participatory meant before we can even develop an evaluation that aligned with those goals. In line with that, I also think we need to educate people on what assessment is and the purpose of it, as we're, as I mentioned more than once. I did not, I will be fully transparent. I did not know what assessments were. I knew I took them because I had to. I knew I had to take it to get into college, but I never understood it. I went back to go to school to understand that because they misdiagnosed my daughter with speech and language disability in Head Start. My daughter was bilingual. She knew Spanish and English, but they used a monolingual assessment that really tied into the English language and how she wasn't developing that properly. As a parent, I was concerned. I stopped promoting bilingualism in her and I focused specifically on her education to get that speech and language just really removed by the time she was in first grade. I did not realize how much that would have impacted my daughter and her ability to continue what she's doing. To this day, she code switches at times. And when we have conversations, and this is information she learned when she was a kid. So I'm now having to battle the conversation of what's English, what's Spanish, and how do I get you to understand because of the middle of both. So it's important to understand what, what the definition is. You need to come to a common understanding of what the purpose of the assessment is. What are we measuring? And who are the stakeholders that are impacted by the assessment? Because from my opinion, in order for this to be culturally responsive and equitable, everybody who is impacted by the assessment should have a say in how the assessment is being developed and utilized. Without that, you're coming from the top up saying, we know what's best for you and we're gonna do this because that's what research says. When you focus it on a different way by bringing in other people, starting from the beginning, having those discussions, who's involved? Who are the stakeholders? How are they involved in this? What impact do they have? Who can provide insight into this information? Who's really gonna be taking the assessments and what are they gonna do with it? All that information needs to be thought about in the beginning as you develop or even develop an RFP at that fact, just to get sure, just to make sure that you emphasize that within your proposal. Also, there needs to be an emphasis on culture responsive practices. I think there is a dominant culture that suggests that everybody has to speak and learn a certain way. And what I've learned through my experiences, because I have a, a, several learning disabilities that I've overcome, is that you have to present the material in a way that's accessible for the person. In addition to that, you also have to meet them where they're at and assess them in practices that are relevant for who they are so that you're assessing them on the actual information they know, as opposed to how to take an American test. And so with that, my emphasis on this whole conversation is really to engage as many stakeholders as possible in the beginning so that you have an understanding of what it is, but also using the coach responsive practice techniques to really get at what, if, what are we trying to identify and how is this relevant to the people that we're looking into. Excellent. I want to I want to respond maybe just a little bit off off track a little bit. I, I, I have great appreciation for you as a researcher and uh, even as a, uh, a practitioner in this realm of evaluation and whatnot. But I want to take a moment to give you kudos and honor you even for uh, the position that you've taken as a parent uh, in this process. Your passion is clear. 
Um, and it's clear that you're driven uh, to make an impact, uh, particularly where it counts. Now, that said, uh, you touched on in a very big way uh, how we might be able to include multiple stakeholders in the re research and evaluation process, um, you know, that can, you know, kind of uh, help to uh, lead to more equitable uh, outcomes uh, for students. But I'm curious about your thoughts on this, uh, going back to that point about parents. Do you have any suggestions on how we might be able to get parents more involved in the process so that collectively their voices can be heard and they can be advocates for their uh, for their children? Definitely. I think parents are an often underutilized resource, specifically within education. Uh, I taught pre-service, I taught pre-service teachers assessments on how to develop assessments and how to engage with parents through conferences. And that was for secondary and elementary students. And one of the things that came to my mind was always, what is the purpose? Everybody I talk to has a common purpose when it's with kids. We want to help them. We want to make things better for them. We want to give them opportunities. We want to make things equitable. That's unified across teachers, parents, cultures. I've made it a point to ask people many times, what is your role as a parent? Because I'm curious about that. And unifying across every culture that I have is that every parent wants the best for their children. And they do everything they can within their power to do that. One of the things that people often misunderstand and don't realize is parents can be your best friend or your worst enemy. And that's in both ways that it's being done. An a parent who's not educated but is dictated by a goal that they want that may hurt others mm -hmm. is going to follow the steps and make life hard for everybody else. But if you educate parents and tell them the benefit of it and how we're trying to help you and really develop partnerships with them as opposed to these unauthentic partnerships where they ask for parent involvement, but in Head Start, my only role as a parent to be involved in was to either participate on field trips because kids listen to a male teacher. They also had me load, they also had me load the bus because as a male, I had the strength to do that. And they also had me clean. They also had me clean the backyard and the and the thing just so I can be involved. Now Head Start requires you to volunteer. It's a requirement for a parent to be participated, but the program I was in decided to say that parental involvement was actually just doing those things. I went to school, learned about how parents can be involved, and I went to another Head Start that my kids were going, and I asked them, hey, can I be involved? And this is how I would like to be involved. With that, I developed a curriculum, a mini curriculum, to where we learned about dinosaurs and excavating. And so we had a sandbox. I bought little eggs. We did an excavating where the kids learned everything. The teachers and parents said the kids learned more language than they've ever learned than they've had than they had because they were using big words to describe it as what's been done. Because I've always met, I've always focused on talking to them at a level that they understand, not lowering the level to make them understand. So I always talked to that level. What that started was parents, hey, can I help? What can I do? What that turned into a development of a parent of a Head Start Parent Council, where now we're a council that meets and talks about what's being done and actually has decision-making power within that because we're one leg of the organization of a three-leg group. So without all everybody being there, it can't be done. So with that, we develop parents, but I also changed the narrative within the teachers as well. I showed them that if you get parents, educate, if you educate parents on how they can support their children, they will be involved. And what that translated into kids who were learning the topics better because now the parents understood how to support them. They were doing more engagement at home activities. They were doing more activities with each other so that they can learn more, so develop better bonds and relationships. That all translated just from one thing of me wanting to help, but them agreeing to meet me at where I can support them at. So a lot of the times it's really having those conversations and really talking about the narratives and assumptions we have about parent involvement and parent education and really creating authentic ways for them be, for them to be involved. I've also worked with parents to assess students. And so teaching them how to assess doing an observation tool to see whether or not they're seeing specific behaviors in their kid has been instrumental into the success of most of the kids within that organization. They've excelled in their ability to do rational thinking. They use manipulatives well, all because of that hands-on training. So it's a lot. And I know a lot of the times it seems very daunting to get parents involved because parents, they're scary. And I've talked to teachers. A lot of times they're scared because the teachers are 24, 25, and they have a parent who's very demanding and want things a certain way. I tell them, let's put that aside. What's the purpose? Our goal is to really help the child. How can we do that? And once you get to that common understanding of, look, I understand you're upset. 
I understand you don't like this, but what can we do to improve? That's the conversation you need to have in order to get people involved. Because once you have that conversation, people have solutions. They have ideas. They've been thinking about things for a while and how to fix their stuff. They also know how to better approach their child in assessments. Why are they not involved in the conversation? Excellent. Thank you again. Kudos again to you. And thank you for being that example. Um, that's, that's awesome. Uh, Erica, I want to expound on something that Carlos even touched on just a little bit. He hit on some points related to partnerships um, as we talked about engagement. Um, what role, I want to speak about strategic partnerships, that is. What role might you say that um, strategic partnerships can play in reforming how assessments are used and perceived in education systems? Yeah, absolutely. You know, if we're thinking about, uh, to Carlos's point of why families matter, why, why it's so significant that families are embedded as a critical stakeholder for all purposes when it comes to learning and assessment. The same goes for community partners and why it is absolutely essential if we're talking about being culturally responsive inside of institutions, that we are embedding and connecting and linking community partners that are living among and um, holding space for our learners um, outside of the academic setting, so to speak. So, you know, I think about some of the programs that are in our communities. We serve 18 westernmost counties here in North Carolina, Dogwood Health Trust, and um, primarily rural. Um, Asheville is among those, but doesn't tend to qualify or be considered as rural. But um, when I think about the success that a lot of our learners have found, those that have been um, living in um, abject poverty, those that are linguistically and ethnically diverse, those that have um, that show up as learners with disabilities, no matter what kind of successes or not they've had before the last school bell of the day, most of them that are fortunate because we also have deserts, but if they're not in a desert and they have access, they have access to some of the most incredible after school, out of school time partners and um, places within their communities. These partners know those families. These partners know those kids. They are the ones that the schools call when the schools have been unsuccessful. They are the ones that the schools call when absenteeism is taking up. They are the ones, we, we have one partner here, um, YTL, Youth Transform for, for Living, Living Learning. Um, there's one particular school where when the teachers or the administration has kind of exhausted all their ways of reaching a kid that's become very dysregulated. They can call that kid's mentor from the YTL program, and that mentor can step in, intercede, be the mediator, get the kid refocused academically, and then be ready to receive that kid, that child, when they come after 3 p.m. and kind of like debrief on all that went on. That's a partnership that we cannot afford to embed and involve to Carlos's point from the beginning. You see, because here's the other reason too that parents can put hands up, families can put hands up in community. We can't wait to turn families and community into emergency response situations because institutions have not received and responded and, and enveloped our students the way that they need to. We need critical stakeholders, partners, community leaders, after school time, yeah, you know, faith community, whomever, whoever is in service to that child, we need them to be at the table from the beginning. What's the why to Carlos's point? What's the end game? What's the goal? I've never met a family and I've worked with families from early care and education. My first job was as a van monitor at a rural early child care center. I spent two hours a day on a van, unbuckling, buckling babies, um, wiping noses, handing bottles, from there to teaching doctoral students. I've never met a family, and I meet families of 40-some-year-olds on graduation day or whatever that said that they didn't want the best for their, their, their child, their teenager, their 20-something, their husband, their wife. Whenever I meet a family member and you watch them look at their learner, get their whole face and their disposition, they've given you everything they've got. The least we can do is give everything we have from the beginning and embed people from the beginning. And so 
these partnerships, um, I am so thankful that in this role in philanthropy, I've had the opportunity to help make sure that we invest in those spaces and those partners that have really shown up for communities and families and kids over time. It's critical. It's absolutely critical. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so to that point about your uh, your current seat within uh, that realm of philanthropy, I'm going to uh, ask you to boldly, I'm going to put you on the hot seat. Uh, and to, if you had a call to action for your, your peers within the realm of philanthropy, um, what might it be or what, what type of suggestion might you have uh, that might prompt them to structure their efforts uh, so that they could be more supportive of uh, these type of efforts, particularly uh, Black and Indigenous uh, people of color uh, in the realm of educational equity? What type of guidance or suggestions might you give for them so that they could have a, a stronger footprint in that realm? Thank you for that. And I don't mind the hot seat. First, I say, name it, speak it, call it out. Let's not run away. To Stacey Abrams' example, she wrote a very powerful piece in the Chronicle, Chronicle of Philanthropy a while back uh, entitled, It's Open Season on Civil Rights. And she and another colleague of her who serves on the board of another philanth uh, philanthropic organization challenged philanthropy to not retreat right now to not retreat. And so I would say, don't retreat. Don't start changing your language and commitment to equity. Um, this now is not the time. And we have a lot of classic, um, we have decades old literature and research on what happens when you have very effective mentoring programs, very effective community-based programs, very effective out-of-school time programs, very effective bridge programs. You know, I, I sit here as, a former Ford Foundation student honoree. I was in a summer bridge program for individuals, so get this, Carlos, for individuals, for African-Americans and indigenous learners at minority serving institutions who were trying to become teachers. Because guess what? In the 1990s, yes, back in the, the dark ages, there were groups of us who were black and brown and linguistically diverse that couldn't get through teacher exams. We used to call it the national teacher exam. Now, Carlos, get this. I really didn't qualify because I had already passed all of my exams, but they still needed their numbers. <laughs> and I was black and I was rural. And so um, my two mentors, Dr. Zoe Locklear at what was known as Pembroke State University, now known as University of Pembroke, and then Fayetteville State, Dr. Sandra Shorter, may she rest in power. Um, they were the African-American and the indigenous um, scholars that petitioned the Ford Foundation to give them some resources to do some above and beyond outreach with this group of students they had that were strong and powerful and eager to be teachers, but were finding these pitfalls. What I didn't know was that I, that I was an out, uh, outlier. I didn't realize, honestly, I was 19. I didn't realize that people were struggling to get through the NTE and all of my classmates in that cohort, and they were able to run it for five years. We were given ex extra help in the summers. We were doing a lot of test prep. They also are working with our soft skills that we now know are power skills because a lot of us, because of us being truly first generation, being from rural America, being Black, being Indigenous, being all these things, we hadn't had the types of exposure that some of the things were really kind of asking us for on a test and that they knew that we were going to run up against us beginning teachers in all the settings that we went into. So we had etiquette classes. We had affirmation classes. We had classes on what does it mean to be culturally responsive? We called it multicultural ed in the 90s, but now it's, you know. So I think about bridge programs because out of that, it was called teaching excellence out, um, among minorities. Out of that effort for five cohorts, they had us, we passed our test, those of us that hadn't before. They had principals, superintendents, we have community college leaders, we have university presidents that all came through and found success because a foundation made an investment in a black and brown institution in the South to help them help their students get over that hurdle. Don't back away philanthropy, now is not the time. It's time to go deeper. Can I add something on that, Bruce? Sure. Excellent. 
<laughs> Actually, Carlos, if, if you don't mind, I, I want to. We have just a few minutes remaining, and we. Um, this has been such a rich conversation. I, again, I want to thank you both for contributing to it in a, in a very big way. Uh, but we have uh, a question in here, and it's a uh, uh, from the um, from our from our audience today. And so I'll read the question to you, and I'd, I'd be very interested in hearing both of your uh, responses, keeping in mind that we just have a few minutes remaining. Uh, as a parent of a child who has been labeled as intellectually dis disabled based on IQ testing, I'm deeply concerned about the implications of such assessments, particularly when they lead to placement in special education and potentially limited opportunities. Given the growing recognition that assessments can be misused and may not fully capture a child's capabilities, how can we as parents, educators, and policymakers ensure that our assessment methods are more equitable? I personally love that question. So I'll take a, I'll take a stab at, the, at, the, at that comment. As a parent, this is important to me because the whole goal is that I want my kids to be assessed properly. I think one thing we can do is be involved in our children's education. So as an active parent, I meet the kids at what, they want me to participate in. So as a parent, I'm also aware that as a researcher, I don't want to cross that line of coming off as being the expert that needs to be done. And I prefer to be brought into conversations as opposed to forced into the conversations. So I'm always engaging with my kids about how they're being assessed and what they're doing. When they use assessment practices that are invalid, I tend to have that and bring that up as a, as a concern during a parent meeting. Uh, one example of that is my daughter was questioned on her ability to speak Spanish because they ran her conversation through uh, Google Translate and it said, and, and an AI detector, and it said that it was AI. My daughter did that in front of me. We talked about it, we're bilingual, so it's what we can be done. I went to the school, talked to the board of districts. I emailed everyone I could to understand what's being done. The solution was they let my daughter pass. I didn't end there. And the reason why I didn't end there because that wasn't the concern. My concern was that they were inaccurately assessing my child. Mm -hmm. So I'm still pursuing that conversation and now working with them to partially develop training, training programs to help support them in that area so they can be better at what they're doing. And so as a parent, I tend to be as involved as I can, but I'm also aware of how it impacts my children. And so I just encourage you guys to also have that conversation with your kids and really being open and transparent about the overall goal and purpose of it. And it does change as they age. Um, I am the parent of a, a student that has been identified with actually as a birth defect. And it started presenting processing challenges for him once he hit middle school and the hormones started flying. And so for the first time, we had to have an accommodations plan. Um, and that was beginning of COVID. So mama handled all the accommodations at home, right? But then when he started phasing back into day-to-day -day school, um, particularly for adolescents, for males, there's a lot of things to negotiate. So to your point, Carlos, constantly in conversation with my son about what, where is it that you want to advocate for yourself and where is it that you want me to intercede? And like you too, I also recognize that it, there's some weight in the room when Dr. Williams comes in, right? So I always try to remain humble and I also make it abundantly clear that I'm his number one advocate. And I do want to make sure that they are getting the literature that they need, current literature on where he is and what he needs. I bring his assessments. I actually handle his assessments away from the institution. I never let them be handled by the school. I had them done privately. I can do that. All parents can't. I recognize that. It's a privilege. But I, I exercise that privilege. I brought in my own assessments. I had assessments done with um, uh, an outside assessor. And so we I manage and control that just like I'm always having that air traffic control accommodations. Are accommodations being handled? Were you invited to step out? Did you make sure you advocate for this? It's exhausting. It's absolutely exhausting. Um, I, I'm not going to speak for Carlos, but it's absolutely exhausting. But I don't think there's another way for me to ensure that this kid gets a fair shake moving through the system. I have to be engaged. I have to be involved. I have to ask questions and I have to hold folks accountable. Excellent. Excellent. And on that note, I'm going to, we are at the top of the hour. And so I just want to thank you both again for uh, your transparency and the richness of this dialogue. As someone shared in the comments uh, in one of the uh, Q and A's, they, they talked about your transparency being very relatable and that um, more of this type of dialogue is needed. Um, and so I appreciate the two of you for taking your time to share and to invest in this type of energy.
uh, and to our webinar participants, thank you for taking the time to come out and join us and to uh, to listen to these dialogues. And I encourage you to uh, pay, pay close attention to the future opportunities that community science will share as we're deeply invested in this realm of equity. And I'm sure that we'll have more topics uh, and presentations that you'll be interested in. So again, Carlos, Dr. Williams, thank you very much for your time and your, uh, your, your willingness to grace us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.